But man, I'm glad to be with you again. Uh, seven is the name of the series. It's seven weeks long. We're six weeks into it. And uh, we're studying through the statements of the cross. I just feel like the, the closer we get to Easter weekend and Easter celebration, the more we're kind of walking confidently under the banner of the cross. Does anybody else feel that? Are you there with me? I, I hope I'm not alone, but I like we're walking more and more confidently towards the end of this series, looking at these statements, and next week is a huge week to, to celebrate it. And really, our prayer is this. I want to tell you on the front end, as we dive into this message, our prayer is one that um, we wouldn't just come to celebrate Easter, that we would come to experience Easter. And what I mean by that is, is that God didn't, God didn't do all that he did and record the scriptures for us and live the life that he lived through his son Jesus so that we could just stand and celebrate it. He did that so that we could experience resurrection like he did. And so next week is not an annual celebration. It's an annual experience and reminder to us that we are alive in Christ that our sin has been paid for, it has been buried in a grave, it has been taken off to the wilderness, right, as we've learned in the series, that God has done something that we could have never found the strength to do on our own. And so we come to celebrate it, yes, but we come to declare that we have experienced new life in him. And next week, I'll tell you what's going to happen is we have five services next weekend, and uh, we've added a few, one here, at, at an extra one here at the Pinita location. Our Cocoa West campus will have an extra one. We do an extra service every year early at sunrise. We're doing it at 7 a.m., and the sun will have just come up at that point, and you're welcome to come and join us for that. Um, we, we do that be, just to relieve and, and make space. Because we always run out of space. And hundreds and hundreds of people come to church that don't normally come to church. And so we'll have many, many people. And I just pray, I pray that you could help us fill the house. Grab somebody. And, you know, if you've invested and in, in invited well, that's great. If, if you haven't, just grab someone and make them come anyway, you know. Um, and, <laughs> and so uh, just fill the house of God as we celebrate and experience Easter all at one moment. All right, sound like a good deal? Yeah. So be prepared for that. Um, here's the thing. Next week is the final statement of the cross, and it's the best one yet. It's the best one yet. Today's pretty good. Today's statement's pretty amazing, but next week is the best yet, and it's going to be an awesome Easter celebration, all right? So today, as we journey into this, um, I want to point out that the cross seems to do something for us as you as you focus on the cross and you focus on Jesus' statements, it happens to, this way for me, maybe you can relate, is that it's seemingly everything Jesus is saying doesn't fit that scenario. In other words, if you picture the cross and you picture the pain and you picture the suffering, but you listen to what he says, there's something within that that goes, this doesn't seem to, like the physical action and that moment Jesus seems way more confident than someone who maybe would hang on a cross. If you really consider the things that he said, he's spoken a word of forgiveness. He declared that, that he was bringing forgiveness to all people for their sin. You see, hanging from a cross, I don't know that, that for that audience, for us, we look through history and see it in a different light. For that audience, they may go, really, sir? You're offering us forgiveness? Did you forget you're the one hanging from a cross? Like, how, how can you have that kind of confidence? He offers to us a, a message and a word of assurance that we could trust him with our eternity. He offers us a statement of love from the cross. He offered a statement of abandonment. For me, that one hurt the most because it helps me understand what my sin did to Jesus. It put him in a position in which he was carried off and away to a distant place out of the presence of God. That's pretty severe. And I, I'm associated with that because of my sin. You're associated with it because of your sin. And then it moves to a statement in the fifth week of that you've all said, which is, I'm thirsty. I need something to drink. And so today we're going to jump into this, this last statement to kind of reinforce that that. Victory in the midst of pain. I want to just tell you a little story that maybe you can relate to in my own life. Um, any athletes in the room? Anybody ever play sports? Anyone? 
okay? Is this an athletic church or what? I mean, let's be, let's be bold about it. Some of you are like, mm, mm. yes, I'm a, I'm, I'm a warrior on the field. Yes, I'm... <laughs> Come on, did you play sports? Anybody play sports, all right? And you were great at it, weren't you? I played soccer in high school, and I remember that at the start of the soccer season, the very first practice in my high school days, we walked into the school atrium. There were two big staircases, about 20 steps on each side, and the coach lined us up at the bottom of the stairs, and he said, all right, all right, boys, start running. Go up this staircase over that uh, ran across that, that second floor there and come back down the other side and just go. I mean, we just ran. He said, I want you to run for five minutes, don't stop. So off we go, I'll give you a, I'll give you a one minute rest and then we'll do it again for five more minutes. First day of practice. And then we went out on the field, which, you know, we're conditioning in, in you know, Florida and it's very, very hot, as you know. And, and we just ran and we did all these different intervals and all these different exercises and we never touched a ball. And I thought, I didn't sign up for the cross country team. I signed up for <laughs> soccer. I signed up for, nobody runs because of choice. Nobody does that. And so, so I, you know, the next day he come back, lined us all up the stairs. He said, all right, boys, six minutes, go. I'll give you a break in between, one minute. And off we went. You know, he did that. He did that with us for, for three weeks. We were running those stairs up to 20 minutes without stopping. And then one minute break. He didn't increase the break. He just increased the run. But, but then we would go outside and we'd run intervals. And I just remember for weeks, I never touched a soccer ball. And I thought, I'm going to quit. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go play football. I'm going to do something else because I don't like to run. Can anybody relate to that? I don't like to run. And so, but here's the thing. Like, if you ever run to the point of just complete exhaustion, like your heart is beating so hard, you, you feel like you're just going to throw up and everything in you is going to come out. Not just the food, <laughs> but just your whole being. It's just you're going to flip inside out. And um, we reached that point many times during those weeks. But there was, a, there was a real significance to that pain, which was a soccer game is 90 minutes long. If you can't run for at least half of that without stopping, we're never going to win a game. It doesn't matter how well you can kick that ball, how well you understand the, 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 you know, the, the science of the, the, the game and, and how it works and the strategy. If you can't run, forget it. And, and I, I began to think about that in light of not just this statement, but the whole picture of the cross, which is deeply more significant. I know, no, I, I haven't missed that fact. I'm not comparing my conditioning in soccer to the cross. What I'm saying is in principle, there is purpose to your pain. And you see that loud and clear from the cross of Jesus. And you're gonna see it again, maybe to a fuller and more final extent in today's word from the cross. Every one of these words has a lesson to it. I want to read to you the sixth statement <clears throat> that Jesus makes from the cross. It's in John chapter 19. John 19 in verse 30. Remember the fifth statement was, I am thirsty. And it picks up right from there and it says, when he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. Let's just pause there, turn to the person next to you, look them in the eye and say, it is finished. Come on, play along. We're preaching together today. <clears throat> it is finished. Notice this, it says, with that, he bowed his head and he gave up his, la he gave up his spirit. We're going we're gonna to focus on that statement next week as we look at the final word that he speaks in that moment. But this is the sixth statement. The term here in the original language is actually one word. The Bible was, New Testament was written in Greek and it translated into three English words. It is finished. The word is, and you may know it, to telestai. To telestai was the, the word. That word was a common word in the, in the time in which Jesus lived. It was used by a variety of people in a variety of circumstances. It was used by servants when they would um, come to their masters and inform them that they had accomplished the task that they had been asked to do. It was used by merchants when they were selling goods. It was used, um, it was used by prisoners when they had fulfilled their term and their consequence and they would receive the, the, the statement 
to tell us die, it is finished, you're done, you can move on in life. Uh, it, it was used in a variety of contexts and places. One of the interesting places I found that it was used was actually in war. The Romans used the word to tell us die in a very unique way. The, the general uh, who would assemble and build a strategy for the battle plan he, with his men, he would, he would create this strategy that he often referred, it, referred to as a mystery. The battle plan was a mystery. Because, I, I mean, I'm not a, a war veteran, but I, I, can, I can go through the history of Roman warfare and realize uh, you probably don't want to expose to too many people what your plan of attack is, right? And so they would conceal that. <clears throat> they would share with a small group. And, you know, uh, just as a, as a note, just in case we've forgotten, the Romans were really good at war. Like, really good. Like it led to their ability to war gave them over a thousand years of reign as one of the most powerful empires ever live on planet earth. I mean, they were, and, and you can attribute it to war. They, they, there's a lot of times you can look at history and find out that a kingdom or an empire or a nation reached a level of power for a number of reasons. The Romans did it by force. They did it by might. They were just strong and they knew how to war. And so they would build this war. This general would come to a battlefront and he would build a battle plan and a strategy for war. And, and then he would only expose it to a small circle of people who would then carry out these legs and, and arms of this battle. They would carry it to the front lines and they would assemble their men. And oftentimes they didn't even know what the other, um, the other procedures were. They didn't know always the full picture the general would hold that himself as the mystery. And then he would retreat to another vantage point where he could watch the battle take place once it occurred. Yeah. Um, and if I was a Roman, I would volunteer to be a general in battle <laughs> because um, I would like to be at a different vantage point where I could watch wars and not be in wars. You know, Can you, I mean, just, just to think about the devastation of ancient war and what would take place on on, on a war ground. And so he would watch. And when he learned that and, and realized that as the plan began to be executed, when he reached the point that he, he knew that enemy cannot return to a place of leverage. That enemy has been pushed back far enough. There is past the point of return. Then he would cry out to tell us die. It is finished. And I don't know exactly how, but he would get that message down to the front lines and, and they would begin to yell that battle cry. And it was, not, it was not a statement of, it's finished, everybody relax. The war wasn't over. It was a statement of, press in. Because those that you're fighting, you have pushed them to the point that they cannot come back. Now go and finish the job. It actually helps me understand, helps me understand why Jesus didn't save this statement for Resurrection Day and why he said it prior. He said, it is finished. You know what they give, the Romans, they would give uh, their war heroes, they would give them uh, little crowns of leaves and flowers on their head. It just doesn't really fit the modern picture of how you would decorate a warrior, but that's the way they did it, you know? That was funnier in my head than it apparently was to you. But as I began to study through that and, and see the, the way that that word was used, I realized the significance of what Jesus was actually saying. You know, there, was, there were Roman soldiers at the foot of that cross. Do you think that that had any bearing on why he chose that word? I think maybe it did. I'm sure there were merchants and there were servants and there was a variety of people who knew that word in their context as well. But I think Jesus saw beyond that moment too. I think he clearly saw you. I think he clearly saw you sitting in the seat that you're in, in this very moment, 2,000 years ago from the cross. I think he even saw you before all of that. The Bible says before the foundation of the world was laid, he was, the Lamb of God was slain. 
Like, I think God saw you specifically and knew that you needed the message. It is finished. It is finished. It's done. The victory has been won and the enemy has been pushed back to the point in which he cannot return. Jesus is in the very last moments of his life. He has two more statements to make. And the first one is, it is finished. I wonder if you've fully stepped into the victory that he claimed. You know that sometimes my mind struggles to understand what that means. I would just tell you this. They wrote this word, the writer wrote this word in the, in the perfect tense. There's different tenses in the language, just like ours. But they wrote it in the perfect tense. And in Greek, what that means is that this was a action that took place at that moment, which would become the past, that had continuing effect into the future. That Jesus' statement, it is finished, is an action that took place, but then has a continuing effect beyond that moment. His victory, just like the Roman general would say, we have it, it's ours. It's happening. The battle is going to come to an end now. Then they would carry out the rest of that plan. That's what Jesus was declaring. And you know, I just find it interesting. Jesus was given a crown too, wasn't he? His wasn't leaves and flowers. His was thorns. It was the part that they would leave out of the other crowns, you know. And they assembled that. And, and I just, in this moment, in reading and studying this, I just, I just thought about the way that those thorns must have penetrated through his skin around his head and actually caused him to bleed. And even that simple picture tells us the strength and the power of the words, it is finished. But if you really want to know, if you really want to know how powerful this statement is and how it impacts your life, then you have to understand who said it. Now, I know that sounds a little bit confusing because you would go, I'm pretty sure Jesus said it. But I think you need to know who he is at the depths of who he is. Because anyone can say the words, it's finished. Anybody can say, to tell us die. It could have been overlooked very quickly. And it could be overlooked even by us today and not grab hold of it. If you really want to understand the, the, the power of that statement and what Jesus was accomplishing in that moment, you have to understand who he is. Is So I want to take you there. Can I take you to just a small part of who God is? It's just one little portion that I want to help you understand today because I think it'll transform the way that you speak to yourself. I think it'll transform the way that you speak into your circumstances and into your families and into, the, into your spouse and your marriage. I think that if you'll understand who God is, it'll give you a new light to understand his statement of victory and what that means to you. Is that not, that's not too confusing. I want to take you to the book of Job because Job, I, I chose it specifically because Job is the, chronologically the first book of the Bible ever written. Job is, how many, how many of you are familiar with Job? Anybody? Anybody? Job, what a guy. That's a lot like what Job sound like right there. <laughs> Job, Job loved God, Job honored God, but Job went through a horrible circumstance in which everything was taken away from him except for his wife, except for his wife, which wasn't necessarily helpful because if you read the story, if you read the, it, now if you read the story, this is, this is true. You should read the Bible. It's true. There's, there's a, there's a moment in which he is, he's covered in, in boils and sores and he finds a piece of clay pot, broken pot, and he begins to scrape them. Isn't that just an awful image? And, and his wife, in the midst of that pain, just said, you know what she says to him? Why don't you just curse God and die? And that's why I say it's not necessarily helpful that, that he still had his wife with him, but he did, and that was the story. And, and there's two interesting chapters at the start that tell the story and what occurred, but then there's actually over 30 chapters of poetry, and, and it's really lament and complaint and pity from Job. It's just like, why? And you're know, like, three friends show up from 
other land and other places, and they just sit there in the dust with him, and they just, they complain with him, you know. And what happens is, it, it, do you mind, could you just pull that down for a minute? Because I'm, I'm trying, I'm going to set this up. I want you to understand what we're about to read. The, the story is that Job reaches a point of such despair that he begins to question God. Why God? And how come? And I can't believe. And this is awful. And this is horrible. And Job is expressing all of this. And in the midst of it, he makes it, it's in, in, the, in the chapters in the 30s, several times he says to God, you don't even listen to me. You never listen to me. Which is a complete exaggeration, which we find out. But have you ever been there? Come on, you've been there. How come you don't listen to me, God? And then, and then you're humbled by life, and you're humbled by God, and he reminds you, oh, I'm, I'm, I don't have a hearing problem. I don't have a speaking problem. I mean, in, the, in, in despair, I found out I have a pride problem is what I have. And, and God's speaking, and he's listening. And, and here's what happens with Job, is that he gets done with his pity party, and God speaks to him out of a storm. Out of a storm. And he says to Job, who is it who casts darkness on my counsel? That's as good. Like, I don't know if you've ever heard God say that to you. I hope I never hear God say that to me out of a storm. That's for sure. God says, oh, who is it that is obscuring my plans? And then he says to Job, he doesn't say it once. He says it multiple times. Brace yourself like a man. I'm going to speak to you now. Whoa. It's just like, it's intense. And God goes on this long explanation and he says these amazing things to Job. And, and he even gets sarcastic with Job. But he asked him this question. Where were you, Job? Where were you when all this began? Where were you when the world was pulled together by me? Where were you when all of this was created? He gets real sarcastic at one point with him and he actually says to Job, you can go read this, it's an amazing story. He says to him, he says, Job, oh yeah, you've lived so long, haven't you, Job? Oh yeah, how old are you now? See, you, sometimes you just need to be reminded in the midst of God's sovereignty and his strength that he also has a sense of humor. Oh yeah, how old are you, Job? Oh yeah, you were there, weren't you? Job responds and he tells us something in his response. I could take you a lot of places. I wanted to go to the, one of the first places we hear this about God. God. Job outlines some of the attributes of God as God communicates to him. Look at this with me in, in the book of Job, chapter 42, verses one through five. Then Job replied to the Lord, I know that you can do all things. Suddenly his tone and his attitude changes. He's like, whoa, okay, I get it. You pulled it together. You hold it together. There's nothing that you can't accomplish. You can do all things, and no purpose of yours could be thwarted. You asked me. Job's going, all right, I heard you. I heard the question. Who is this that obscures my plans without knowledge? I heard that question. Surely I spoke of things I did not understand, God. Things too wonderful for me to know. My eyes had heard of you, but now my, my ears had heard of you. My eyes now have seen you. This is strong. Job's response to God is, I get it. And I'm sorry. Now the story continues a bit, but I wanna, I wanna highlight these three things. The first thing that you need to know about who said victory from the cross? The first thing you need to know is God is all powerful. God is all powerful. The scripture says in Colossians 1, it's not on the screen, but it says that he, he holds all things together to this very moment. He is all powerful. He can do anything. We need to know that. If you don't know that, if you can't grab hold of that and grasp that, guess what? 
you'll struggle to believe the statement of victory from the cross. God is all powerful. Do you agree, church? I, I have a picture I want to show you. Do you have a photo in there? Do you happen to have one? Yeah. That's my grandma, Sarah Stockton. That's my son, Judah. This picture was taken a few years ago. And uh, my, my daughter, Brielle, back there climbing on Amanda. And then my grandfather. Isn't that a great picture? Um, my grandmother, Sarah, went home to be with the Lord just um, a little over a month ago. She was 87 years old. But when she was 62, she went in to uh, have a procedure. She had some issues with her heart. And she went in to basically have a heart cath. They were going to clear some arteries in her heart. And as they began to attempt that, um, the arteries just shut down. And um, it created such an emergency that the doctors and surgeons brought my, my family around in that moment and said, you're going to have to say goodbye because there is very, very slim chance that she's even going to make it through a surgery. And they went into an emergency open heart surgery that they had not planned to do. And she died twice in one day. And each time the doctors were successfully able to, to, to fix the situation and she came back. I mean, my family in that moment was praying. I, I've heard the stories. I was not there myself, but I've heard the stories of my, my uncles and my mother and my grandfather and how at that moment they thought their life was all about to change right there in that moment. And, it, and, and God miraculously turned the corner for my family. And God gave my grandmother 25 more years on this earth. You know why? Because he's all powerful. Amen. You know, I have people, and, and you probably have people in your life who see things that happen that way, and they go, oh, that's just a bunch of blind faith. It's like, it's just the doctors, you know. And I would say, yeah, but you know what? I'll accept that. I'll accept the, the criticism that maybe I live by blind faith because you know what? I'm not going to live on my own certainty. Yes. My own ability, my own power, because I know it's very limited. Now put my hope in a God who says, I am all powerful. You can do all things, Job said to God. You can do all things. And I'm aware of that. I just think about how my children would have never had a relationship with her had God not sovereignly reached into that moment, carried that forward. You know, that, that woman is, and, and, and her husband, my grandfather, they, they are the foundation of my family's faith. They were the first. And both sides of my family, both sides have come to faith in Jesus because of them, because they were obedient to God. And we've seen the miracle of God and the details of his power in the moments of our life like that one. Maybe you have. The second thing you gotta know about God is not is he only all powerful, but he's all knowing. God knows everything. Everything, the book of Hebrews says that God knows everyone and everything and every part of your life lays bare and wide open to him and none of it can be hidden. He knows it all. He knows it all. And in the last few days of, and actually a few years of that grandmother's life that I had, they were, it was incredible amounts of pain and suffering. From about 84 to 87, she just lived in incredible physical pain every day of her life. And, and we asked the questions, of course, to God, why, like you do? She's lived for you. She's lived a good life. And she behaved well enough, God, you know, that this shouldn't happen. And we don't have all the answers. Can I just tell you that? I don't have all the answers. I know you've struggled with that probably in your life. I don't know how it hits you, but God is all-knowing. He has the answers. And sometimes he doesn't give me the full story beginning to end. And that can be frustrating. But when I look at the cross, I believe he knew the beginning from the end. And I find confidence in his knowledge, not just my own, to keep going forward. You see, he holds the mystery, right? And he knows the plans across the entire battlefront. I don't know them all. I just know what I've been called to accomplish. So I'm gonna keep moving in that. You know, my grandmother said something really powerful to, to my mom in, in the last months of her life. She said, you know what, Danae? She said, I think that I love life so much that I just am gonna have to suffer to convince myself it would be better to go home to heaven now. 
You know what that is? That's somebody who says, I don't have all the answers, but I am sure of who I believe in. The third is, is that God is ever present. He's ever present. Again, the book of Hebrews says that he'll never forsake you. He will never leave you. You know, almost when my grandmother passed, I shared a few moments with her that were really special to me and my family. And, and we were all there around her bedside as she took her last breaths. That's amazing to me that I got to be there for that moment. This is kind of like what you hope for, that your life doesn't end tragically, but it ends in a peaceful manner with your loved ones close. And, and, and you know what? I felt, here's a, I'll just be real honest with you. I felt guilty at how good I felt in those moments and after she had died. I, was, I didn't know what to expect, but I didn't expect the way that I did feel. And I got over that guilt when I finally realized it was the grace and the presence of God. He had already been in that moment waiting for us to arrive. That's how good the grace of God is. He is all powerful. He is all knowing. He is ever present. That is the God who hung on a cross and declared in the midst of pain. I know it doesn't look like it, but I'm telling you right now, victory has just set in. It is finished. And only that God could say that with full confidence and it means something for your life today. The psalmist wrote in Psalm 46 that there would never be a moment that God would abandon those that he loved. Abandonment is not his mode of operation. He's with us. Are you grateful for that today? What does it mean? Like, what are you going to do with that? Like, maybe you've been declaring some things over your life that don't look anything like to tell us die. Instead, they look like the moment of the cross. Pain, suffering, end, death. And maybe you've aligned yourself to what the circumstance looks like rather than what God speaks through it. I just want you to know something. I have no desire to study God's word and transfer information to you. But I do have a desire that with you, as we center the word of God in our lives, and as we rally around it, that it would transform and change us. And I'm just telling you, I think that some of us, the greatest thing we could do is declare victory the way Jesus did in our life and in this moment even though it doesn't always look like victory. How do you do that? Well, one is you got to talk correctly to yourself based on who you have believed. Can I just tell you, it's really important that you know who you've believed before you know what you believe. And I know who I believe. I believe in the God who is all powerful, who is all knowing and who is ever present in my life. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah, I think we should clap about that. Thank you, whoever did that. That's some good preaching right there. <laughs> I want to take you to a few texts and give you some, I'm going to move quickly through these. I want you to just grab, like, what are you going to do? Can I just give you a, few, a head start on a couple of thoughts? You need to declare well God's truth in your life, and you need to declare well who he is. It's those who know who he is, know what he said, and believe that they are who he says they are, that actually live in the continuing effect of Jesus' statement, it is finished. It's those people. Are we those people? Yeah. We're those people. We are those people. Look with me at this text. Would you, it's, it comes out of 1 Timothy, is it? Or 2 Timothy? Chapter 1, verse 12, Paul says, I am suffering, yet I am not ashamed because, look at this statement, I know whom I have believed. Church, do you know who you believe today? Yes. You know, and I am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him for that day. He's talking about the fact that he's entrusted his very soul into God's eternal purpose for him. He's like, I know God's got me. I know whom 
I've believed. Do you know who you, whom you've believed? Let me tell you a little bit about whom you've believed and how to declare God's truth today. I'm gonna give you four statements that are just starters. Maybe you're already saying these things to yourself. Maybe you're already declaring these truths from God's word, but I just wanna use them as a, as a jump start today. Here we go. Ready? Take some notes. Number one is God... God, here's what we want to say about it. I know that God loves me. Some of us struggle with this because you go, I just, I cannot envision that God would, why would God love me? Because God is love. It's not just what he does, it's who he is. He loves you. Some of us need to wake up tomorrow morning. Some of us need to say this before we leave this room. I know, God, that you love me. Instead of walking around as if my behavior has thrown question into that reality. Instead of walking around with the doubts of what you're facing and going, I'm just not sure. What, you know, will you condemn God to justify your thought process? God said, I love you. He died for you. Who's done that for you lately, by the way? right? There's a book of the Bible dedicated to complaining. Did you know that? <laughs> An entire book. It's all complaints. Lamentations. The laments. I was explaining to my children one day when they were complaining that they need to learn how to take their complaints and turn them into praise. It might have been a parenting fail. <laughs> because um, they're seven and four, you know? It's like maybe a pastoring fail as I tried to parent and pastor my kids. I was explaining to them that there was a whole Bible, a book in the Bible that was all about complaining, but that that complaining turned into joy. And how, I know you're upset about that, but what good can you find? I know that you're not wearing the exact shirt that you wanted to wear to school today but I'm sure that you'll survive. <laughs> what are you excited about, son? Nothing. <laughs> so I, I, uh, I explained that there was a book called Lamentations. It was a book of what, it was called that because it was a complaint. It's called a lament. And, and eventually that lament can be expressed, but it needs to find a new road of joy. And I'm trying to teach my children this, right? And my daughter, she's four. She says to me, Daddy, I would like one of those little mints. <laughs> okay. Good talk, kids. Good talk. The prophet is lamenting and he says, I remember all my bitterness. That's where he's coming from. I remember how awful life is. And then he says this in verse 21 of chapter three, yet this I call to mind and therefore I have hope. Some of us need to dare to believe today and dare to hope today. Some of us need to look at the bitterness and the suffering of our life and yet dare to believe this truth. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They're, they are new every morning, and great is your faithfulness. Does anybody feel today the Spirit of God telling them, this is the thing you need to declare that you have left behind? That God loves me, and it has the power to transform your life. Be assured there's a purpose, there's an end to your pain. The second one is this, I know that God wants the best for me. He finished the work. If he paid for your sin, what else is he gonna withhold from you? I'm glad you asked. Romans chapter eight says, if God is for us, who can, be against, who can ever be against us? Since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, there it is. Won't he also give us everything else? God knows what you need. He knows what's best for you. He has what's best for you. Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? Does it mean that he doesn't love us? What's the answer? No. no. Despite all of these things, overwhelming 
Victory is ours through Christ who loved us. He loves me and he knows and has what's best for me. Some of us have walked around and declared the opposite. I wish God would just show up for me if he would give me that. No, he, you want God to give you what you think's best for you instead of humbling yourself and saying in light of all that I've struggled through, maybe God actually does know what's best for me. I'm not trying to be harsh today towards you. I'm just trying to help you understand. What are you declaring are you declaring it's finished? Are you declaring something else over your life? The third thing is this. Maybe you could say this today. I know that God has a plan for me. I know. He's got a plan. You ever felt like you don't know what you're doing? God knows what's going on. God's got a plan. I've had some pretty awful moments as even as in ministry as a pastor. You just like, if I could be candid with you, I've had pretty dark moments in my life where I felt like I have no idea what in the world I'm doing. I mean, they're just moments where you have, con like in the context of doing ministry life, you're like, am I getting anywhere? Are we making any progress? Does this make sense to anybody who comes to church at Central Life? Like, they're just those moments. And you know, God speaks in those moments. He said to the nation of Israel in Jeremiah 29, you probably know this by heart, verse 11, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Some people say that's been overstated. Like we talk about it's over applied. It's put in too many contexts. No, it's not. That's the best statement you can find in the Bible right there. He said that to the nation of Israel when they had been hauled off into slavery. He said to a group of slaves, don't worry. I know the plans I have for you. You're going to prosper. That's a picture for me of the cross. Jesus saying, I am victorious. And that audience probably looking at him going, I think he's lost his mind. <laughs> God knows the plan. Maybe you need to declare that today. You know, they say that, that, that eagles, they don't jump from the nest. The eaglets, you know, the little ones, they don't leave the nest because one, mom keeps bringing fresh fish every day. And two, more importantly, because of the down feathers in the nest, they're so comfortable. So you know what mom eventually does? She starts pulling out the feathers that she built into that moment, into that life of that little baby bird. She starts pulling them out, starts dropping them off so that nothing's left but sticks. Why, because she wants them little babies to die? Nope, she wants them to fly. Hey, I just rhymed. <laughs> I love it when things like that happen. God knows the plans he's got for you. Plans to prosper you. The fourth is this. I know that God will bring me through. I know he's gonna bring me through. Can I just tell you something? I, I tell myself that every day. I know he's gonna bring me through. I know it. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 18 says, the Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Does anybody in this room feel the spirit of God speaking to them that this is their new declaration today? God will bring me through. I love the story of Paul. He said to Paul, guys, you can come on back, team, prepare. He said to Paul, if you don't stop preaching, we're going to cut your head off. Paul said, would you? Come on. What? You know what? Sharpen the blade. Because I'm not going to stop. Yeah, Paul, some of you are like, Paul didn't say that. Yeah, he did. He said, to live is Christ, to die is gain. You want, to, you want to take my life? Go ahead. But I'm preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I know that whether I'm on this side of eternity 
or I'm actually on the other side past death, I know it's all good what God has for me. I, know, I was about to start rhyming again. <laughs> I love that story of Paul. Paul is like, come on then. Take my life. He eventually loses it for the gospel, doesn't he? That's what happens to Paul. You know why? You, you can't, what can you do to a person like that? A person who has believed in the one who's all-powerful, he's all-knowing, he's ever-present, there's nothing you can do to that person. Life takes on different meaning. New perspective begins to enter into our minds. You know what? I, I, I just I want to invite you to stand to your feet right now. We need to declare some truth about God. We need to declare some truth about our lives in light of God. We need to declare the victory that Jesus won for us on the cross. Is anybody today, I know this, I'll put you on the spot, okay? I just want to know. I just want to know who's with me. I am going to declare some new truth over my life in the days to come. Because Jesus paid everything so that I might be able to do that. So anybody in this room who say, Pastor, I'm going to declare God's truth as well. Come on. All right. Great. I'm counting you. I, I'm with you. I see you all. Father, we love you and we worship you today in confidence and in faith in Jesus Christ, your son, who gave his life for our sin. I pray today, I pray today that you would fill our minds and our hearts with your truth, the truth about who you are, that you love us, you have our best in mind. There is a plan even when we don't see it and that there is no doubt there is no doubt you will bring us through whatever life forces us to face because you've won and you've already declared you have the victory. And that's our victory today, God. We accept it. We step into it because you offered it to us. I pray that the Central Life family would walk with their heads high in the confidence of who you are and what you're doing in transforming our lives. We pray this in the name of Jesus, amen.